pues continuamos con el desarrollo de esta idea. Let us continue with the development of this idea. Our Lord tells Luisa, I come. I come to give you the greatest gift. I come to teach you how to live in my will, for which the first thing that our Lord begins to teach Luisa is how the divine will operated in Jesus and in the Most Holy Virgin. But first and foremost, in the humanity of Jesus. As we reflect on this, let us keep this in mind. With original sin, man was separated from God. Speaking in human terms, God extended himself in order to reach man. He extended himself so to speak, to the point of searching for man in the abyss that he was in. And what is? What is most stark to us is the extent to which God descended for us humans to reach man, the point that God extended himself the most is the passion of Jesus. Jesus crucified. Let's put it this way. It is the lowest point to which God descended to find the creature in the abyss in which he was found. So when man meets God, at whatever level man may be, he has to first meet with redemption. That is to say, with Jesus, the crucified one. And it's from there that you begin to know Jesus more and more. It is for this reason that St. Paul said, <clears throat> God, free me from preaching another Christ that is not crucified. Because that is where God teaches us and remakes us, where he teaches us the cost of sin and shows us the way, the help, the strength, and the light to get out of our sins. Of course, for those of you who in some way, from what I see, are linked or attracted to the renewal in the Holy Spirit, all must be directed to this point. The action of the Holy Spirit with his seven gifts in the soul, communicated to the soul, leads us or should lead us to the identification of our life with the life of Christ. That would be the full effect of the action of the Holy Spirit. Because, as I was saying, <clears throat> there are those who see Christ crucified, but if the Holy Spirit does not enlighten them, they do not penetrate into that crucified Christ like so many, let's say, pagans that exist today. For example, a Muslim, a Buddhist, may see the crucifix, but it seems that the Holy Spirit does not enlighten them to discover what is the deeper meaning of the crucifix. No one says, Jesus is the Son of God, except through the Holy Spirit. And even less would one say, Jesus crucified is my Redeemer, my Savior, except through the Holy Spirit. So things being so, the first thing that our Lord teaches Luisa is his passion and how the divine will worked in his passion. Because, 
of the passion of our Lord. We have the Gospels. We have everything that the church teaches, and we have seen the suffering Jesus manifested on the outside. We have seen nails, crown, crown of thorns, wounds, a bloody and shattered body. And here I am, seeing the sacred, the sacred heart of Jesus, how much he has suffered for man. The heart pierced with a lance, a wound, not of the heart of flesh, <coughs> because that wound we have already known since Longinus. Now we see much more. Not the wound of the physical heart, but the wound of our Lord's interior. That is how we go deeper, and Luisa is not exempted. And the first thing he teaches her is his passion, and how the divine will, that is to say how his divinity operated, and what it did in his interior, in the passion, which we are used to see only from the outside. When we see cru Christ crucified and meditate, we do our exercise considering how the prayer says the five wounds. <clears throat> and then we imagine how much it would hurt us if a nail pierced our hands to be flagellated or to be nailed to the cross. Perhaps we feel the weight of a heavy wooden cross placed on our shoulders when when we are considering <clears throat> or feeling things simply in a bodily way. But this is a part of the passion that our Lord suffered, a dimension of the bodily passion that the Jews inflicted on him, and in some parts the Romans too. I would say that in the dimension of the passion, in that dimension of the passion, be attentive in that dimension. None of us here participated in that dimension, no. We live 2,000 years later. We weren't there with hammers in hand in that dimension of the passion. We don't concur. But in the other passion, the other passion, we can discover that there are three dimensions. In the other, in the innermost, the interior, there we do concur. Here is the heart, my heart, that has loved men so much and has received nothing but ingratitude from men, there we all concur. <clears throat> with our ingratitude, with our ignorance, with our frivolousness, which causes pain to the heart of Jesus, this is a second dimension of everything that forms the passion of our Lord. The bodily passion that the Jews gave him, that dimension lasted 24 hours. The dimension of the interior passion that each and every one of us gave him lasted 33 years, plus the nine months that he was in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. More if there were some other days after the 33 years. As well, that second passion, that second dimension, we cause it, each one of us. But there is a third dimension, 
es la que todavía no se conoce. One that's y que no es not que yet known. Le hace, le And thus our Lord ¿Sí? taught Luisa that this third dimension existed. Because to teach her how to live in the divine will, he had to teach her how the will of God worked in the passion. In the passion, not only how, not only how many nails were put into him, not only how much are in gratitude, but what was happening inside him. <clears throat> We have seen and considered that Jesus takes the cross upon himself And what are our thoughts? How much this hurt him? I repeat a little, how tired he would be after the flagellation. But who has said? And what was he, and what was he thinking at that moment? What was he thinking at that moment? He was the incarnate word. Do you think that inwardly he had all this, his attention focused on how many kilos the cross weighed? As perhaps we would have, if they laid a cross on top of us, it seems that all our attention would be diverted and concentrated on that point. And we would say, what a heavy cross. It weighs 82 kilos or 40, whatever it might be. And we would concentrate our attention on that and, and on the pain it, that it caused us. But Jesus, what was he thinking inside? Where did he place his thoughts? Not only in how much the cross weighed on his shoulder, not only in how much ingratitude of everyone, and especially of those who were putting it on him, and to whom he was also redeeming, but a much greater interior vision in this third dimension. How the will of God worked, his will and his humanity at the moment of the passion, and this is a dimension that in the very beginning, Our Lord teaches Luisa so that Luisa may also follow him in this divine dimension of his passion and learns to participate in this dimension of the passion of our Lord. And in this dimension of the passion of our Lord, we can all participate in the dimension of bodily passion. I would say that it is impossible. Who needs or would want to corporally go through everything that Jesus went through? Perhaps it is even impossible for us. Absolutely impossible. Who wants to participate in the second dimension? Perhaps by modeling our life on the life of Jesus, we can begin to feel pain for the sins of others and foremost for our own. We can feel it. <clears throat> But how can we prepare ourselves to participate in this third dimension of the passion that the divinity made the humanity of Jesus suffer. This is the third dimension. The passion that his divinity made his humanity suffer. Not the bodily passion that the Jews made Jesus suffer in his body. Nor the second dimension of the pain that all of us humans have caused in that heart that has loved us so much. That would be the second dimension. The third dimension is the one that the divinity made the humanity of Jesus suffer. And to know 
this third dimension, we, we had to wait for Jesus himself to reveal it. He revealed the bodily passion the, the day they made him suffer it because he suffered it in full view of all. <clears throat> the torture he suffered was palpable, easily perceptible to the witnesses, and through them it has been transmitted to all of us. The second inner passion has been revealed through out time until reaching, let's say, the stage of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which sort of recapitulates at that moment through St. Margaret Mary, this second dimension of his passion. And we have to get to Louisa to know this third dimension of the passion that the divinity inflicted or made the humanity of Jesus suffer. To understand this, <clears throat> and be able to prepare ourselves to participate, it is first necessary to know how the will of God works. Up to now, we knew how nails enter a body and in some way, how a heart suffers like the heart of a mother before an ungrateful son, before the misfortune of a son. There we have a certain reference that allows us to get close to feeling the ingratitude. Our interior pains help us in some way to discover those interior pains of Jesus. But the pains that his divinity made him suffer, of these he either reveals them to us or we have absolutely no reference to be able to know them, much less understand them, much less have the intention of participating in them. Our Lord takes Louisa in the beginning phase to this point to make her know how the divine will works in the passion and then how the divine will worked throughout the rest of his life and later how the divine will worked in the Blessed Virgin from the moment of her Immaculate Conception until her Assumption. This third dimension of the passion, the divine dimension of the passion suffered by Jesus as I tell you, either he reveals it to us or there is absolutely no possibility of knowing it. Of the other two, as we have already examined, yes, our senses can assimilate that revelation. Why not say it that way, of the passion of our Lord to each one of us, but of the other it is impossible it is impossible for the creature if God does not reveal it to him. Even among us, who can know what the other is thinking? We are able to see what the other is doing. He is walking, he is eating, but not what he is thinking. <clears throat> Either they tell us, or we have no way. If someone finds me eating alone in a restaurant, they will be able to see what I am eating. But what am I thinking? Either I tell them, or it is absolutely impossible to know. All the more, if it were the incarnate word. In my case, it's about me, one just like you. Who could somehow say what he is thinking about, the consomme that he is having, whether the chicken is hard or not so much, whether the chili is spicy or, <clears throat> or not, that you might be able to know by using a certain imagination. But if the one who was eating was the incarnate word, 
who could say what he was thinking, what he was doing internally either. He reveals it to us or it is absolutely impossible for any creature that can even remotely intuit it because to do so it would be necessary to be another incarnate word. And so this third dimension of our Lord's passion that the divinity inflicted on him. Our Lord taught Luisa how it was and it acquires divine dimensions. For example, knowing how the will of God operated in the humanity of Jesus, we will discover, for example, things we already know. The uni universality of the passion of Jesus. How is it possible that Jesus has saved all humanity and each one of us? We would say, oh well, this is already simple. It is possible because his divinity was at work in his humanity, the acts that his humanity did, his divinity, in the sufferings that Jesus endured through his divinity, vivified by his divinity. All these acquired the ways of how the divine will operates. And one of those ways is universality. Another is, is omniscience. Another is eternity. Another is divine sanctity all that was put at stake because his divine will is put at stake in everything that his humanity did. So that is why he saved each and every one of us because his divinity, his divine will at work in his humanity produced universal acts, universal sufferings that reached each and every one of us with an infinite value. We already knew this. Another characteristics or quality of the actions of the divine will is that everything that is done, everything that is done in it, whether on the part of God or on the part of the creature, everything remains in act eternally without ever losing any of the effects it produced. Just like the sun. God does not need to create a new sun every day. It is an act of giving its light and heat to the whole earth and to all nature ever since it was created. In the same way, <clears throat> everything done in the will and the will of God remains in act eternally without losing its effects, without exhausting itself in anything. That is why Jesus was able to redeem all of us and continues to redeem us at this very moment. And this very moment, we are continuously receiving all the effects of the redemptive acts of Jesus and of the passion of Jesus as if he was in act right now of suffering it. All this thanks to the qualities of operating in the divine will. If Jesus had not had the divine will as life and everything he did, he would not have been able to even redeem himself. He needed his divinity in him and all the qualities of the work of the divine will to redeem all of us and each and every one of us to continue later. Our Lord teaches Louisa that not only his passion is in the act of being done, but also all the acts that he did throughout his life like the sun, 
without diminishing itself in anything. It is giving us all its fruits and all its effects. There are things in nature that are so natural to us that we are familiar with that now help us understand better. What a simple thing to say that the priests repeat the Last Supper today as Jesus sacrificed himself once for all and the priest at every Mass is taken from what is in the act of being done, not from a simple human act 2,000 years ago, but from an act of Jesus done 2,000 years ago that is done totally in the divine will. It is an act in the eternal mode, and the priest takes what is in an act of being done, he puts it in the species of the sacrament, and for Jesus, who is eternally in the act of doing it, there is no difficulty or inconvenience for the con consecration to happen. And therefore, the host is consecrated, transubstantiated, transubstantiated. We continue. Another of the qualities of the work of the will of God is the multiplication of works. One act is multiplied into many acts for as many as God desired, for as many as God wishes. And we have this again in the Eucharist. Just one was enough, a single Last Supper, a single this is my body, so that it can be multiplied as many times as desired. And in the case of the sacrament, with the intervention of the priest, this quality of God's work multiplying as many acts as desired from just one allowed Jesus the capacity by his divine will operating in him to multiply all his life for each and for as many creatures that would come into the light of the world to earth. Then what happens? Each one, each one of us has the whole Jesus for himself, for himself. <clears throat> he is not a Jesus divided for everyone. That would be a human way of working, like here, there is one. Jose Luis, and nothing more, just one for all. I cannot multiply myself 80 times for each of you to have the complete me, but Jesus, in the divine will, with his divinity working, in his humanity, he could do that in a naturally divine way. So his life and passion multiplied and multiplied as many times as there would be creatures in such a way that each one, each one of us has a complete Jesus in front of him at his total disposal. The same thing happens in the Eucharist. We prepare to receive communion. And it is not that we each receive just a portion of a Jesus for all. We receive a complete Jesus for each one. Is it not obvious that it is not that you receive a finger and I another, and the other receives one foot? So why are these things so obvious? How do we already know that the life of Jesus in the sacrament is multiplied by how many there are of us? This is by the power of his divinity to multiply many times. But how many creatures we are in such a way <clears throat> that each of us has an incarnation of the word for himself alone. Each of us 
receives all of the love of God now made flesh for himself alone. Jesus dwelling for nine months in the womb, most holy virgin. All the acts in the life of Jesus, each of us can take for himself alone, and so on. But we have to continue, because this has many effects to rouse us up, to know his to know who is Jesus, to stir us up, to get to know who is the incarnate word, so that the Holy Spirit, promised by Jesus, may lead us to the whole truth. That is, to the whole incarnate word, because the truth is the incarnation of the word. Then, Waking up in the knowledge of how the divine will operates and how it worked in Jesus, we get up with eyes truly opened to know who is this Jesus of mine, this Jesus of yours, one Jesus completely for you, an incarnation of the word just for you. I repeat, he incarnated with all his love just for you the whole life of Jesus only for you. Jesus' life lived with qualities of divine will that wants to make life in you. The infancy of Jesus lived in the divine will that is an act of living just for you. We can journey through the entire life of our Lord and reach the passion, one passion of Jesus, with these divine dimensions, which we will expound on later, suffered just for you and only for you, not just for you, but only for you. And when you find this, Jesus who is just for you, yours, there you will find the universal Jesus who is also for me. And there in your Jesus, you will find the passion suffered for you and just for you. And you will also find in Jesus the passion suffered for me. Since this is an act in the divine will, you will be able to associate your feet. He now takes <clears throat> he now takes possession of your will and communicates to your will the very qualities of this work of his divine will. And by this will of God, you encounter the risen Jesus just for you. Having now this all-encompassing knowledge of this Jesus who is all for you, just for you, you will no longer be content to live as you did in the past. The hazy vision of Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago will be removed. Who knows? By what means? His influence reached you, more or less, effective, more or less intense. That vague image will be removed. A real Jesus will resurface with his divinity, working in his humanity, who desires to make life out from each of your acts. And there are many other considerations that we can meditate on and learn as we go, as we go deeper into the knowledge of the will of God and how it worked in the humanity of Jesus. As you are able to see, make a, making a parenthesis, I am now talking about the operation of the divine will, the operating, 
not about the dispositions of the, of the will of God. These remain as foundation, but we are going deeper. We are going higher, speaking of the will of God in its in interior, the third dimension, the third dimension of the passion that Jesus suffered for each one of us was the passion which the divinity inflicted in him. And this passion caused him not one death, but millions and millions of deaths. Not the death that we are used to understanding as death, which is the separation of the soul from the body, and the body is lifeless. And we say he died. The body is lifeless, but the soul is not lifeless. It is the body which is lifeless. And we understand this to be death. And when we talk about the death of Jesus, it seems that we mean only that death on the cross. And certainly it happened. But there are other deaths that Jesus suffered on behalf of his divinity in his humanity. Because what is death? Not the separation. Well, simply, when life does not find the life it wants, it suffers a death. The divine life, the life of the divine will, wanted to find its life in the act of every creature. <clears throat> in all our acts, as soon as original sin entered, the divine will began to feel death in the human will because now it could not find the life that he wanted to live. What he found was the life of the creature that interrupted the free course of life of the divine will. And therefore, the divine will found death. More clearly, the divine will found death in sins. What are sins? Sin is the death of the divine life on the part of the creature, and the death of the divine life in the creature, which is the worst. It is the worst dimension of sin, because in the death of the soul to grace, to the divine life, this death happens to creatures, <clears throat> but the death of the divine life, but in the death of the divine life, when the creature denies to God the life he wants to find, this death happens to the Creator. Therefore, the divine dimension of sin is what happens in God when the creature sins. The human dimension of sin is what happened in the creature when the creature sins. On the one hand, the creature dies to the divine life. And on the other hand, God or divinity dies in that act in which he wanted to have life. Such were the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Death to humanity. And deaths inflicted on the divinity every time the creature sins. <laughs> All these deaths, Jesus had to suffer as his own. We will need our imagination to be a little more awake so that the Holy Spirit may help us understand what we are talking about. We're talking about Jesus containing all of us, the Word incarnate containing all humanity in himself because 
we were all created in him. Because in this sense, and here we can see it more clearly, we all laid our hands on him. As St. Paul tells us, I wish it had only been our hands. We not only laid our hands, but all our sins. <clears throat> and not only in the sense of the death that we deserve, but in the sense and in the dimension of the deaths that we gave to God in us. So everything that was contained in Jesus, everything was on him. We made him feel, and the divinity made him feel those deaths one by one for every sin that we have committed that caused the absence of the divine life in us and Jesus had to suffer those deaths to fill us with life again and make life available to us for every sin and for every bad act of ours. So this third dimension that I told you requires holy imagination and Holy Spirit is much greater and much more painful than the first physical dimension and the second passion due to the ingratitude of the creature. This is the third passion that divinity made his humanity suffer in a divine way to redeem all of us and to redo everything that man had done wrong. And in him, the work of God would be perfectly accomplished. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is another of the ways the divine will works that our Lord made known to Luisa. At this time, I believe I have reviewed it <coughs> too quickly, and I don't know if it has been within reach. But what I do know is that it is some material that I give you, and the rest is in the writings of Luisa. From there, I am taking it, so that in personal meditation, in personal reflection, and helped by the Holy Spirit, we can grasp who Jesus truly is and we can delve into that in the measure that we understand and know more how the will of God works and how it worked in the humanity of Jesus for the glory of the Father and for the good of each one of us multiplying a Jesus of this kind for each one of us. I leave this material in your thoughts. And I would hope that it remains with all of us and with me first. I say in me first for being the most in need. In the heart too, because we have great need, let us meditate.